obviously for better bike infrastructure. And I know that's not really something that's on the agenda tonight. Um, we're kind of focused on the Burlington High School redesign and how people will be getting to the high school in the fall when they um, maybe bus use might be discouraged. Do any of you know if that's something that's going to be on the agenda for the next meeting? Uh, Kelly, uh, if I can speak, uh, we normally take July and August off. It's unlikely since we are having a special meeting this month that we will have a meeting in July, in August. It's still possible. Uh, and we're, we're able to if there's a need for it. But at the moment, there is no plan for an August meeting. So the first, you might say, regular agenda uh, and, and um, that could, could include uh, the high school and uh, school openings and so forth. And we know the new superintendent of schools wants to uh, address each NPA. That probably right now looks like the September meeting and it will still likely be on Zoom. That's all I can say at the moment as a steering committee member. Okay, thank you. I know that's something I thought I saw on the um, MPA for Ward 1 maybe, but yeah, we'll keep an eye out for the agendas and such. I don't see any other raised hands and I haven't received any more emails. I, uh, I tapped the raised hand several times. Oh, there. Did you want to do it, Tony? Did you have a raised yeah. hand? Yeah. yeah. Yep. After, everybody, after everybody else, so I didn't want to, to jump, jump in line, so. You um, can go, yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to speak briefly, um, one, uh, I'm having uh, issues with my family, uh, not my not myself or my household, but in members of my family who live elsewhere, uh, with the lack of of, uh, 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 of of quick testing, and obviously no tracing. Um, uh, that's I, I know that that's not going on, uh, and and that's that's a difficulty. I think that we 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 even though we have few uh, cases in Vermont right now. The infrastructure that the state has is not very functional when it comes to testing and tracing. That's very similar to other areas of the country. I specifically wanted to talk about briefly North Street. Uh, in the work that uh, um, uh, on the North Avenue corridor, or the, the I should say the Winooski corridors uh, plan, uh, which Jacob Flanagan and Alyssa Faber were our representatives, one of the things that came out of that was the finding that North Street, which is our, um, our, our main street of commerce in the Old North End, um, in our school, we have schools, we have the uh, uh, Old North End Community Center, uh, we have a lot of businesses and a lot of residences. What we found uh, was that every single intersection, uh, practically every intersection between uh, North Avenue and North Union, four, four intersections, including North Champlain and uh, uh, also North Street, are all high crash intersections with at least one injury a year on each of those. That is probably the most dangerous residential slash commercial street in the city. Um, and it needs to be, uh, I know that there's a discussion uh, from the Arts and Business Network uh, in the past about what could, what could be done for that street. Well, I think that we now have reached the point where we do need to study that because the, of the high number of, of injuries. Um, just note that uh, there was going to be a demonstration at North Street, which is in North Winooski, which is one of the high crash locations in the, in the city. We have 20 on the state list, but that's been delayed now because of, well, we know why it's being delayed until next year. So we will, uh, we will have uh, nine years of this particular administration. I sort of, I sort of like, look at the Weinberg administration as being nine years. It's like nine innings of a baseball game. We're in the last, we're in the ninth inning and they have yet to address directly a uh, strong um, improvement to any of the uh, high crash in, uh, intersections in the city. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Perfect, do we have one more raised hand? Um, Molly, you should be able to speak. Hi, it's actually Alyssa Faber. I'm here. 
there in the queue. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Melissa Kane did a public announcement, so I just wanted to tell everyone that from last time, we had the $1,500 from the NPA to do the mask initiative in the Old North End, and so far, Melissa has distributed 600 masks um, that um, were pre-made, and some we have volunteers in the community making, and we probably have another 600 masks out in the community that people are making to on the update everyone on that initiative. If anyone knows of specific groups, families, or organizations that need masks, let Melissa or I know. Okay, uh, that's all for raised hands, I see. Tony, are you facilitating or is Kevin? I'm taking notes. I'm not facilitating. I see. Okay. I'm, I, I hope that either Barbara or Charlie or Kevin uh, would be willing to do that. I'm here, but and willing, but nobody has told me the procedure for these debates because I missed the steering committee planning meeting. All I have is a list of names. It, yeah, I'm just going to say I did the I I uh, moderated the last meeting. It's it's not easy with the Zoom, but you just sort of have faith. I think you have to have a little bit of faith and it will, it will work out. That's not my question. How, how many uh, minutes do, do each, does each candidate have in the debate? I think Kevin said five earlier, but. And then who, then who um, will you act as timekeeper? Um. I could probably do that. It might Wait. be hard. Uh, yeah, I'll do it. The agenda okay. says 45 minutes for the House of Representatives, and it says it's a debate specifically on the agenda. Okay, and I don't know if I that's helpful at all. That Emma Mulvaney Stamick will not be here until 7:15. So, what shall we do? I would suggest uh, start with a Senate candidate since we know there's some that are here. Uh, okay, I, I'm gonna do that. Um, so starting with them, um, on the new agenda, again, does each of them have five minutes as well? And is there time for questions and answers? We, we, at the steering committee, we did, we said five minutes for each candidate to present their views. We did not provide for a quest Q&A. Uh, if, if a candidate wants to use some of their five minutes for that, uh, then uh, certainly that, that's allowable. It's, that was on, it's out of their five minutes. Okay, very well. I will start in the order of the list that I have on the last agenda that Kevin put out, and it starts with Phil Baruth. Is he here? Hey, Mom. Hold on. Hey. Yeah, I don't see him here. Okay, next person is Tom's, uh, Tom Chastanay. Is he here? Some people might not be expecting to be on right now because the agenda that's, said it would be an hour. In, that's so. very true. You're right about that. So I'm going to go through the list. Um, if the person is, I, I know Earhart is here. So um, Earhart, would you be willing to begin? Sure, thanks. It took me a moment to unmute. Oh, we can see you now. Yay. 
<laughs> Hi, folks. Uh, okay, so you have five minutes, including questions and answers, if you so choose. Sure, great. Uh, thanks, thanks for the time. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, for I, I know a number of folks who are uh, both attendees and, and, and panelists and uh, appreciate the time on your agenda, especially because Kevin uh, is one of the folks that came in late on this. So uh, for folks who don't know me, um, I've been a Burlington resident for over 40 years now, uh, served on the city council, uh, spent a year uh, as president of the city council back when uh, Bernie Sanders was mayor. Um, really got involved in uh, public policy issues and in uh, community activism, community issues uh, back in the early 80s uh, when the neighborhood planning assemblies were, were first formed and was actually a charter member of my Ward 1 uh, NPA. Um, so really, um, you know, community engagement has been one of the things that has been part and parcel of, uh, of my life for, for, for many years. Um, for folks um, who know me, you probably know that I have been an affordable housing advocate and an advocate for uh, homelessness issues for over 20 years. I'm actually a, a registered uh, lobbyist at the State House. I spend a, virtually every day with uh, Representative Krowinski, Senator Sorotkin, Senator Pearson, uh, with Dylan, with the other, uh, with uh, Gene, um, folks uh, that I've worked with uh, for, for many years. Um, and in addition to affordable housing, because affordable housing touches so many different issues and is foundational, uh, I have a very broad public policy background. I also spent 11 years uh, as legislative liaison for the city of Burlington. Uh, part of my experience is also working uh, for the city of Winooski um, uh, back in the uh, 80s and 90s. So I have a really broad array of policy experience um, from my housing advocacy and from my work in uh, municipal government and representing the city of Burlington. Um, so, you know, we're in a unique moment. I think we all recognize that we're in a unique moment. The last three months of the pandemic have taught us many lessons. Um, the last uh, couple of months of, uh, you know, watching it with horror um, as uh, African American uh, men and women uh, have been. Um, uh, murdered by the police uh, has been another defining moment. Um, these are two of the things that uh, have made me decide that I wanted to run at this point to represent Chittenden County. I think I have a lot of experience to offer. Uh, I would be, uh, because of my involvement with the legislative process and the, um, the I think, positive respect, relationships that I have built up with uh, many folks at the State House, uh, I think I'll, I'll be ready to work for Chittenden County on day one. Uh, on a whole array of, uh, of different issues. And uh, in terms of the issues that I wanna focus on, uh, I wanna focus on economic justice, uh, protecting uh, everyday working Vermonters um, from what uh, may be uh, an austere budget as the state faces its uh, current revenue shortfalls. Um, and uh, also, obviously I wanna advance affordable housing uh, from the other side, uh, from the side of being an elected, uh, an elected official. Um, I've, been doing that for many years and it's one of the big issues for uh, for Chittenden County and, and for the for the state. Um, also I want to focus on social and racial justice issues. Um, I am a proud father of a 30 year old uh, young black man who's a success, successful social worker. Uh, I have seen uh, what happens to African Americans in uh, in our state and uh, I think as an elected official I want to focus on that and really subject uh, all of our uh, state policies and laws to a, a racial justice, uh, a racial justice lens, uh, and continue the work that the legislature is doing this session on reforming police uh, police policies. Uh, lastly, I'm also going to be a climate change advocate. Um, we were told uh, two years ago by the UN that we have 12 years uh, to save the planet. Basically, now we have 10. Uh, housing is one of the uh, major contributors to the state's, it's the second largest contributor to the state's carbon uh, footprint, um, transportation being the first. Uh, and I think, um, you know, housing can help make a difference in that regard. And especially if we continue to build in and near our downtowns in areas that have, uh, that are close to services and close to uh, public transportation, uh, that will also help the state um, begin to uh, meet some of its climate change goals, which it has fallen woefully behind on. So I'll, I'll just stop there, see if anybody has any, any questions for me. Um, hopefully I've kind of summarized um, some of my experience and 
uh, where uh, where I'm coming from as a potential candidate. Oh, I should also mention I honored to uh, have been endorsed by Rights and Democracy um, last week, and then uh, also um, just um, last night by the uh, Chittenden County of the uh, Caucus of the Progressive Party. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions, anybody? I think you have probably about a minute left. Is that right, Sydney? That was five. That, that was five? Just at five minutes, but um, whatever you guys want to do for Q and A, it's okay. Um, do we have any? Do we have any candidates that have arrived from the uh, presenting list? I don't think so. So maybe we can do a minute or two of questions. Well. And I'm I, also happy. I'm happy to stay on. Um, I'm a and candidate. If you want to take, if you want to take questions later, you've got quite a few candidates uh, here: June Heston, okay. uh, Chris Pearson, okay. Senator Sorotkin, Dylan. Okay, Sorry. good. Okay, I'm going to continue then down the list. Is Phil Baruth here yet? Thank you. Uh, what about Tom Chastanay? Um, Dil Dylan Giambattista. Hi, Barbara. I'm here. You give me the sign, I'll get right to it. Okay. Um, go on, Dylan. Hi. How are you? Sure. Yeah. Well, first, let me just thank everyone for having me tonight and for your community involvement. It's really important. And I know you're doing it at a distance, which adds some logistical challenges, but certainly appreciate the forum. Um, I'm one of the many candidates running for Chittenden State Senate this year. I'm the only active state representative running this year, and I have a lot of respect for everyone who's stepping up and putting their hat in the ring. So thank you all for being here. My name is Dylan Giambattista. I represent the community of Essex Junction. I've served on the House Education Committee for the last four years. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees for the Vermont State College's Board of Trustees, and I'm someone who has uh, come into public service based on my experiences. You see, if you had met me a decade ago, I was living down on either Decatur Street or Ward Street in the North End, and I was someone who didn't have much going for me, frankly. I was working minimum wage jobs, wasn't sure what would come next. I was at the Community College of Vermont because several years earlier, I had dropped out of high school. My path has been challenging growing up here in Vermont. I worked odd jobs, I worked in the trades, I worked in restaurants. I know what it's like to work a minimum wage job, and I've worked alongside many folks and gone to school with many folks at the Community College of Vermont who have faced those same challenges. I got involved with public service because I was fed up, I was frustrated, I was looking for opportunities to get involved and give back to my community. And I've been fortunate. I ended up transferring up to Johnson State College after being at the Community College of Vermont. And from there, I embarked in a career in public service. For the last eight years, I've worked in various roles, I worked for the Vermont State Employees Association, which is the union representing public employees. I ended up working for our state treasurer in the Vermont State Treasurer's Office. I am a state employee and remain a member of their union. I worked for a time as the aide to the Speaker of the House. And in 2016, the voters in Essex Junction uh, elected me and we unseated a uh, incumbent Republican to ensure that our district represented the values that my neighbors told me they wanted to see. I'm someone who's focused on the moment that we're in. And let me tell you something, we're in a bit of a pickle here. Uh, COVID-19 has impacted everyone. And as a state rep, I've been on the phones every day with folks in our community who have had challenges, uh, who have been unable to access workers' comp, whose children no longer can go to school or didn't have access to childcare, with small business owners trying to figure out how to make it. And at the same time, COVID-19 has unmasked some of the institutional challenges we have in our state how fragile the foundations of our systems are, uh, our schools, our service providers, institutions that care for those with the greatest needs. And as someone who believes that government is here to lift people up, that's a focus of mine. So let me just give you a quick rundown of where I'm at. First of all, I wanna see a COVID-19 recovery that leaves no one behind. And to do that, we really need leaders who are willing to lead with their values, bring their lived experience, lift up the voices of those who are struggling and support bold policies to move Vermont into the future. I'm gonna be focused on things like education reform because as a high school dropout, I know that people need opportunities for whom school might not be a good fit. That means personalized learning that has off ramps for our students who might find an interest in an apprenticeship, an internship in the trades or at our colleges. We need to boost our investment in public education in this state and that means higher education. For too long, we've ranked at the bottom 
for investing in our colleges and universities, it's no longer accessible or it's no longer acceptable either. And it's actually saddling the next generation with debt. I will support increased investment in public higher education. We need to focus on the issues of housing. Erhard talked about it before. We need to ensure that renters can afford to rent here, that we have adequate housing stock that is healthy, that is climate resilient and ready to go. We need to invest in housing. We need to invest in broadband to ensure folks can access the data because COVID-19 has shown us there is a digital divide. We need to ensure that we are addressing climate change through action. And while I've, while I've supported all the bills that have come through the legislature, it's not enough. It's time to invest in the green jobs revolution and ensure that we are tackling our climate goals and reducing our emissions. We need to reform our justice system. We need to hold the police accountable. We need to address systemic racism that, that runs throughout our systems. And we need to ensure that we are treating substance use disorder as a medical condition. We need to stop criminalizing poverty in this state, and we need to do it together. My name is Dylan Giambattista. I'm a state representative out in Essex. I believe I have the right skills to hit the ground running for you. And if you want to visit my website, check out the agenda. It's www.vtdillon.com. I hope I can earn your support. And if I have any time, I doubt I do, I'm happy to answer any questions. But otherwise, call me, text me anytime, 802-734-8841. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dylan. Um, so, um, I, since I seem to be the de facto um, facilitator, what I'm going to do now is return to the original agenda because I see that both candidates um, for uh, Vermont House are here, um, for Chittenden 6-2, uh, both Emma Mulvaney-Stanek and Jean Sullivan. Thank you for being here. Um, we have 45 minutes for this um, debate. Um, do, are you both prepared with some kind of opening statement? Yes. Yeah. Uh, how, how long yeah. do you need for it? Usually I would get, tell you, but you tell me. Uh, is five minutes good? I think five minutes is more than enough. And also I'm excited to let folks uh, at the NPA ask questions as well. So Gene, is, does five sound okay? Five or less? Oh, I'm all good with that, yeah. Okay. Okay, so what, what I would suggest is that you each have a five minute opening statement. Um, another five minutes to rebut each other, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Is that okay? Great. Okay. Right. Um, okay. And um, I, I don't know either of you well, so I'm just going to call on Jean to go first. Is that all right? Of course. Thanks. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I got to say one thing. I miss our community dinners. The good mm -hmm. news is, is two expats from the Ward 2 and 3 community dinner have now relocated in the Ward 4 and 6, uh, 4 and 7 community dinners. So now we're having community dinners there too. It, it just, I miss them. They're wonderful. Um, and I'm looking forward to them and I'm glad that it's moving on. I want to introduce myself. I'm State Representative Gina Sullivan. I'm a Democrat running for re-election for my sixth term. I currently serve as Vice Chair of the House Commerce Committee. I've lived in my house on Village Green for 40 years. Some of you might remember me from my first store, the Spring Discount Beverage on North Avenue, or my second store, Sweet Dreams, the candy store in Burlington Square Mall. I needed to raise my son and my daughter as a single mom. I bought Sweet Dreams because I knew retail would work well for me as a single mom. I was able to be home during the day. I worked night shifts. I had babysitters, not daycare, which is a lot cheaper. And I got to volunteer in my kids' school and be home when they came home. The store didn't make a lot of money, but it kept the house and it kept food on the table. After the Sweet Dreams, I did sell that store and became a stockbroker at Merrill Lynch and eventually created O'Sullivan Asset Management, a financial consulting firm. As my kids grew, I became more active in the Burlington Democratic Party. I started out as the Ward 4 chair. I was also the city clerk, the ward clerk for Ward 4 for 10 years running elections. Then I became city chair and county chair. Then I got to spend 11 years on the Burlington Retirement Board. That was the time that we invested in the land trust, best investment we ever did. I moved over from there over to the Burlington Electric Commission. I was served as vice chair and was on the organizing committee that started Burlington Telecom. And just as an aside, we should have kept it. It was the best investment we had. It broke my heart that we had, that they sold it. In 2000, I got elected to be a, represent Ward 7 and City Council. 
I served three terms. It was the hardest job I have ever, ever done, bar none. It's politics, it's potholes, it's everything in between. You've got no support. You're on your own and you're working 24 seven. I've got the utmost respect for everyone who served, including Emma served, so she knows what I'm, she's smiling, she knows what we're doing. In 2012, I was appointed by Governor Shumlin to replace Mark Larson in 612, and I've been serving ever since. I started out on the House Commerce, on the House General, um, and it was the House, General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. And in 2013, I wrote the first ever in the nation bill that required and held accountable a National Guard unit on an annual basis of how many sexual assaults, sexual harassment, and discrimination events happen and what the adjudication is. I am still working on that. I am not done. I later moved on to, be to, to House Commerce and I'm now Vice Chair. It is an interesting and tripartisan committee. The proudest thing I can say in COVID is the work that we did in House Commerce and I spoke to a few people earlier before we came, but in the COVID release, relief package, there are three really wonderful things. And I've got a shout out to, to Senator Sorokin for the first one. It was Michael Sorokin and I, and I say that clearly, got COVID workers comp coverage passed. If we didn't pass this, your grocery store clerk, and if they got COVID, they wouldn't get workers comp, they would have to fight to get it. We changed that. We changed that and we also created a safer work environment because we put the, we, the burden of proof for the, work, for the employer now is on whether they've kept a safe workplace. So that was revolutionary and we've supported now first responders and every single worker who goes back to work has the opportunity for workers comp. And that's important because COVID has a long life. 10 years from now, someone could have lung capacity problems with COVID and workers' comp will cover that. That was important. It, without Senator Sorokin, we couldn't have gotten it done. I also put in a $5 million grant program for minorities and owned businesses and women-owned businesses. That was also a shout out to Keisha because Keisha's working very hard to, to reach out to the new American community. I also put $5 million into the Restaurant and Farmers Feeding the Hungry program, which is an expansion of what Skinny Pancake is doing that buys food from local farmers, goes to local restaurants, goes out to food and secure. That's it. Thanks. Barbara, I think you said Emma, though you're on mute, so I don't want to talk over you. I did say Emma, thank you. Okay. I'm very good uh, at the I'm a master lip reader now. I live on Zoom, so great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and hi, neighbors in this virtual world for which we're living in. Um, I first want to say my lovely wife is putting our baby to bed. So you might hear a baby in the background. That is real life. Um, and uh, I, I ask for your forgiveness if you hear him in the background. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Mulvaney Stanek. And I really uh, appreciate the MPA holding this uh, extended forum for Gene and I to talk around the issues and why we're running for state representative in this part of the old North End and the new North End, Chittenden 6-2. Um, I know many of you from living in the neighborhood for nearly 15, 16, 17 years or so, all in the old North End. Um, and I wanted to start by saying uh, a little bit about myself and then talk more about why I'm running and why I decided to step back into elected, um, elected politics and or seeking your vote. Um, briefly, I live over on Front Street near Battery Park. Um, I am an organizer professionally. I've spent most of my life working on economic justice. I worked for the Labor Union Vermont NEA for over a decade, um, advancing uh, contracts and supporting workplace rights and protections for teachers and support staff all over this beautiful state of Vermont. Um, I'm an activist. I was raised by a bunch of peace nicks, uh, hippies down in Barrie, Vermont and Central Vermont. Um, and I am uh, doing them proud by continuing activism work around racial justice issues, around showing up on um, uh, peace issues, et cetera, and have never wavered really on that commitment to uh, making sure activism is a part of my life, that it's a, it's a main piece of what I'm trying to instill in my children that I'm, I'm raising now. And finally, speaking of children, I am a mom, full disclosure, again, that baby might cry in the background, 
And that has really radically changed my perspective and my sense of urgency of why it's important to run for office and have people who are in every stage of life um, elected and serving in the state house, as well as frankly on city council. You have a different sense of priorities as you move out throughout your life. You have a different sense of what's urgent and needed. Um, and I think that's a one big piece I have to offer folks in this race is to consider um, that valuable voice that's, that's really lacking in that state house in terms of people who have children under five, who have lived through um, the struggle of childcare expenses uh, today, what they're like, as well as um, the struggle to meet basic needs. Um, so with that, here's the, here are the three reasons that have really um, inspired me uh, around stepping back into um, a seeking office. And that's to advance workers' rights and economic dignity for all. Um, as I said, it's, I've spent my entire professional career working in that realm. I started at the Vermont Livable Wage Campaign, advancing minimum wage increases, the first cost of living increase back in uh, the mid-2000s on that minimum wage. That was done through a legislative campaign I helped with organizing and leading in the State House. Um, I, I really truly believe that when people have income inequality, our state does not do well, um, our communities suffer. And it is an underlying cause of, of, of so many other issues when people can't have their basic needs that, met. So um, it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach around looking at things like minimum wage to livable wages, um, workers' rights in the workplace. I'm glad that um, Jean has done some work on workers' comp. We can do so much more to modernize labor laws around unemployment, around looking at self-employed folks and business owners. I'm now a self-employed person myself. So it's really understanding the needs of working people today, no matter what age they are. And the other two issues I'm, I'm really cent uh, focused on are working to advance equitable schools and progressive education funding. Um, so that uh, in the realm of both uh, from my, my years of working within side by side with public educators, are really looking at um, moving to the next level around understanding how we fund education in Vermont and understanding that um, there's so much more we can still do around making a progressive taxation system so that property taxes are not a burden to folks who are um, are moderately incomed and, uh, and need that extra support. Um, and in terms of equitable schools, that means really looking at uh, what our schools are offering and what they're not offering. Who's not reflected in not only the teacher workforce, but what's not reflected in the curriculum that's being delivered to students who don't see themselves reflected in what is being taught. Um, and also looking at school policies and other um, areas of bias within our systems that uh, don't serve don't serve students uh, today of, of, um, in the world for which we're living. And then the final issue that's near and dear to my heart is really looking to fight for justice for folks who've been historically marginalized. Um, you don't have to be very far here in the Old North End. My house gets surrounded every time that there's a Black Lives Matter protest next to the police department. Um, it is in the air we breathe and it needs to therefore be part of every uh, conversation, I, I believe, in the State House around how we must do better we must um, look at um, uh, where biases and within state laws around conversations to make sure that we're centering uh, folks of color, black, brown, indigenous folks, but also looking at other issues. Is that time? Related to LGBTQ and other um, issues. 30 more seconds. Oh, 30 more seconds. Woo. All right. Well, um, what am I going to say? 30 seconds. Well, because I think the, the biggest piece to, to recognize in these times is that um, there is bias. We all have bias. And there, um, there are... Um, there's bias within our institution that includes law, laws and how laws are made. So it's about centering folks who have been voiceless in that process and being true champions and allies, um, even if we don't identify um, as an LGBTQ person or as a trans person or as a per person of color, we must do better. Okay, thank you, Emma. Um, you didn't hear me when I was mute, muted, Jean, but I thanked you as well. And um, you have some time you have some time to um, say more things that you might want to say, or to um, to um, distinguish yourselves from yourself from Emma, if you want. What we're generally calling a rebuttal. I don't know if we do rebuttals in Vermont. I, I, you know, not. So, I mean, first of all, I've known Emma and I've known each other forever. I knew Emma in the minimum wage fight because that's the bill I reported on the House floor, and that's how, that we got passed. So that I we we knew each other from that. Um, I, I think, I think a couple. She brings that you brought up a couple of good things. I'd love to talk about because one of the drivers for me in this next session is tech education. And talking about equitable education, we have a system that it costs a sending school money to send a kid to tech. 
So consequently, no kid goes to tech school. Children are not given and are not offered the full range of what they could do. Tech education is STEM education. And with the demise or somewhat demise of the state college system, I've been working with Dylan and also been working with, uh, with my, another coworker on my commerce committee to, they're coming around to the idea that we, what we really need to do is marry VTC with CCV and adult tech and then the K through 12 tech ed and create an entirely separate tech education fund away from the, the regular ed fund. And as far as education funding, it is ridiculous. The property tax is supporting that. Chris Pearson for years has been putting in bills that I've been signing on to about this. I know that nationally we're looked at as being fair because we have a, a uh, income part to our property tax. But in reality, if we moved, in, we moved education off of the property tax and onto income tax, it would be more equitable and we'd get more money and it would be evenly distributed and we would not have the battles we have every time we're budgeting. The most important thing though is we need a tech program that is statewide, that rolls out so that every one of our kids has an opportunity to have a career that is sustainable and they can raise a family on it. A hundred percent of our graduating seniors have no clue how to make a living. So I'm working that I'm working very hard on that. Um, the other thing about unemployment, which I'm fascinated by, is we had the pandemic unemployment assistance program, which the feds basically paid for and stood up, and we've got the computer program for it. I will be working aggressively this year to make sure that we translate that, transfer that into a statewide unemployment uh, fund for gig workers, unemployed, you know, self-employed people, and sole props. It's perfectly doable to do. So that's, that's a very important part of what we want to get done. Um, I'm working with Selena Coburn on a, I, what we would like to do, and this will be coming in as an amendment when we go back in session on August 25th, is there's no reason why the state should be investing in companies that, that have a ratio higher than 10 to 1 from the lowest paid to the highest. We have the Veggie, the Vermont Employment Growth Income uh, Growth Initiative. We have the Vermont Training Program, and we have VITA, the Vermont De Economic Development Authority, which is like our state bank. We are joining together with the Workers' Caucus to make sure that every program that we invest in will only invest in companies that have a ratio of one, no higher than the highest paid person is not paid higher than 10 times the lowest paid person. That way, that's how you build a sustainable economy. Okay, thank you. Um, Emma, is there more you would like to say? Uh, yes. Um, so it's so funny. Do we do rebuttals in Vermont? That's so, it's, <laughs> I, I think this is more of a conversation. Um, so I'm glad, Jean, that you brought up um, around just issues of education and, and not only the funding side, but finding more pathways for um, students to find livable wage jobs and sustainable ways to stay in Vermont. That, mm -hmm. is, that is really a, a, a modern day uh, dilemma for all parts of Vermont. I grew up in central Vermont, and um, there are so many folks who really struggle to be able to stay in the state and to uh, really look at um, the priorities of the state rather than looking for attracting folks from outside the state, but how can we invest in young people here and give them what they need to not only be successful coming out of, um, of high school, but be successful in whatever, um, whatever uh, job they choose to, to work in within, within the state. And that includes folks who work in childcare, for example, and folks who work in the schools and, and take jobs that have been traditionally um, undervalued and contribute to things like the gender wage gap um, and, and to be able to kind of um, put state dollars and investments in where people are working, jobs that cannot be exported out of our state. I do just wanna mention in terms of education funding, I think a lot of the work there is UVM put out a, um, a study recently and, this, and the legislature has been, um, I think, briefly talking about it at least and it requires and I think deserves much more discussion around examining how we educate or excuse me, how we do education funding and to look deeper into Act 60 and looking at the issues of, of the different weights that are, are um, applied to per pupil calculations and not to get super in the weeds. But when examined, this UVM study really re, um, revealed 
that a lot of that methodology is outdated. The weight, the weight granted to students who are considered in poverty um, it should be much higher so that communities who are working with and, and um, have high populations like the Old North End and parts of the New North End of high poverty um, uh, students' populations get more resources because there's more, of a, more, more struggles and more needs to invest in schools supporting those, those students and those folks. Um, the, other, the other piece um, I want to mention, I also have um, in my platform a piece around unemployment and learning how we can adapt old models that we said were not possible to, for example, expand unemployment benefits to folks who are self-employed in the gig, gig economy. And I think we have to be bold. I think a, a slight distinction perhaps here is that um, I, I believe in um, bold progressive change and not incremental change. I think we've seen that um, danger with minimum wage for years now in um, Vermont and elsewhere, is that it doesn't get us anywhere towards um, people being able to really truly really meet their basic needs. Um, it, uh, it's, it, there are very small steps and it doesn't make the bold change that people are really begging for and, and needing. And so when it comes to unemployment benefits or paid family leave for that matter, um, we need bold change and not um, uh, sort of playing politics in the sense of worrying about what the governor is going to do or not. We need legislators to stand up and say, let's legislate what's needed to be responsive to Vermonters, um, and then let the governor do what he or she someday um, will do. So I think that bold, bold leadership around economic policy is um, really fundamental here. And then finally, when it comes to uh, leveraging state dollars, whether it be through COVID funds or um, through uh, BEPSI or other ways that we um, support business development in the state. I also think we need to be bolder there. We need to do more. Um, I appreciate the ratio um, piece around the lowest and highest paid employees um, in, the, in a company, but I think we also have minimum standards of livable wages and accountability where it's not just during the life of a, of a, of a grant or a loan from the state, but um, an expectation that, that um, businesses that benefit from public dollars are held to that standard as they continue to grow and prosper in the state. And I think we need to do more for women and um, marginalized businesses. I'm glad that there was $5 million allocated through COVID funds, but as I understand it, that's less than 1% of overall um, funding that was allocated. So I hope, Jean, we can do more um, because we know that there's already so many barriers um, facing women. I'm a woman, I own my own business. Um, uh, and there are so many barriers facing us already to close the wage gap and to be successful that the least Vermont can do is to acknowledge that and invest more resources into um, populations that, um, that face those struggles. Okay. Hopefully Thank that you. was a respectful rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, th those were great. I mean, you're, you're both so qualified and brilliant. I don't know how people are gonna vote. But anyway, I'd like to, um, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself because we never did that. I'm Barbara McGrew and I've been on the steering committee forever and um, live in Ward 3. Um, what I'd like to do now is open the floor up for questions for about 10 minutes, um, max. And um, I'm new to facilitating. I, I facilitate virtuously, but I've not done it virtually, so I don't know how to... Um, actually, Sydney, may I ask your help in, in um, yep. doing hands and recognizing people? Thank you. And I'll keep time. It's 7.30 now by my watch and we'll go to 20, 20 of. I don't see any raised hands right now. And just a reminder for, to raise your hand, right? Is this for questions, right, Barbara? Right. Okay. So raise your hand. There's a button at the bottom of your screen. Um, that says raise hand, you can click that. And if you aren't able to see that function, you can always email or text mpa at burlingtonvt.gov. And I will say if you're on an iPad, it's um, you have to click on the, the, your name on the particip participants list and the option to raise hand will come. See, see you still see nobody? No one. Okay, then. Um, Oh wait, panelists. Yes. Oh, Erica. Okay, good. I'll ask a question. Uh, earlier, before the meeting officially started, this is a this is a question for Emma. Um, earlier, before the meeting started, people were chatting, and Representative O'Sullivan 
uh, made a comment that we need to make sure to have a veto-proof majority in the state legislature to be able to override a governor's veto. And I asked if, I, I commented that I was surprised that she thought that uh, being able to override the protection provided by separation of powers, that that was okay. I was surprised that she, that she thought that was okay. Where do you stand on uh, the importance of separation of powers? And uh, do you think it's okay to advocate for the ability to override them? Thank you, uh, well, on Jean first. Well, I called on her first before, so I'll call on Emma first and then Jean. Great. if you have a reply to this. Okay, thanks, Erica. Well, thanks for letting me dust off my uh, political science degree here. Um, you know, in, in the most academic sense, you know, our democracy does better when every um, arm of government, every, every part of government does its job and comes to the table ready to really engage in democracy. And yet we're living in very partisan times, right? So there's a reality check around um, everyone needs to both be playing around the same rules and also um, engaging in a way that's productive for, again, advancing policies that actually impact Vermonters' lives and not getting stuck in the politics. So in concept, I'm, I'm completely about um, supporting um, uh, different arms of government and, and uh, working with the governor, working with, and the governor working with the state legislature, um, because that's when I think the best policy and the best work comes out. We saw that with um, the moves towards gun reform in the state, um, when uh, Governor Scott was able to move off of, I think, traditional roles that he has held around that issue. And we've also seen a completely breakdown around workers' rights and uh, the teachers' uh, teachers' health insurance and that struggle where the governor didn't come and work in good faith with the legislature. So it's a mixed bag. There's not an easy yes, no answer to that. I, would, I, I think it also matters who's in the legislature because the legislature itself has to um, both do the work in the communities with Vermonters to say, are we hearing you? Are we representing you? Are we moving the right policy forward? And if that's the case, then that same community and those same constituents should be speaking to their governor to um, say this is a priority to pass whatever it might be, family leave, um, whatever the, the topic may be. Okay, Jean. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk about family leave. We almost, family leave, now that people have gone through COVID-19 or are going through COVID-19, people fundamentally understand what's happening to families and what family and medical leave would mean, mean for them. We needed to override a governor's veto for that. That's why we do need to have, to have a, 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 a veto override majority in the House. If you want to see, honest to God, big change, we need that. We need to really, this is, this is, the, this is the economic equivalent to the Great Depression. I sit on House Commerce. We have literally thousands of unemployed, untrained workers out of the hospitality industry who will not have jobs. We have to move fast and we have to move boldly. And we, the House, need an ability to do that. And that's what that veto will give us. Thank you. Um, oh, any yeah. other questions? Oh, Barbara, we can I respond? Oh, oh. Um, excuse me? Barbara, do you mind if I respond to the family leave thing? Is that, if that's not appropriate, I can bring it up at another time. Yeah, when you have your time to talk, maybe. Um, Got it. Okay, good. Um, are there other questions? For these so candidates? I'm gonna, so Hannah's got her hand raised and I think Erica does too. So we'll go to Hannah first. Hannah, you should. Yeah, and Erica's going to hold her comments till she she's on for running. Okay. Okay. Um, Hannah, you should be able to speak. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to ask a question to Representative O'Sullivan. Um, I just wanted to hear more about your work protecting women in the National Guard. If you could elaborate on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. When I got in in 2012, the sexual assault resource coordinator, because I was in general housing and military affairs, I asked a question, it was before don't ask, don't tell. And I asked the question, what happens in your community or what's the climate if that gets lifted? How safe will people be? And she said in militaries to me on the record, that's the least of my problems. 
I didn't know what she was talking about. It was 2012. I took that disc home and I had it in my car and I played it and played it and played it to figure out what it was. And then the Invisible War came out and the Skelton Report came out and the rapes and the assaults. And now Vanessa Gwilin's death came out. We now know these things. It's stunning and it's happening here at home. We had a rape in the guard last year. We had a physical sexual assault in the guard last year. I know that because I wrote that bill. No one else wrote that bill. I reached out to George Till, who's a guy, who's an OBGYN at the hospital. He knew what I was talking about and we did it. We're not done yet. What we're now trying to do is work with active members in the guard. And I've got H401 on the wall in House General right now that will put a person hired by the governor in the adjutant general's office on gender diversity and and, and sexual harassment and both for my, not just for male and female, but for minorities and to report back to us every year. So we really know we have eyes on that. So that's my push now. I'm trying to get support. It's a big deal. The guard does not want it. They think they can police their way out of this. They can't, they need to change the culture. And I will work on that until I can say safely that one young woman young Vermonter who sees an opportunity in the guard can go in there and can be valued and can have a career and most importantly can be safe. One in four women get assaulted. 100% of them get sexually assaulted, sexually harassed. So, sorry if I'm on a soapbox, but this is, I, I, I can never let that go. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? We have just may about a minute left. So I may I comment on that as well? Of course, go ahead. Thank you. Sure. Jean, sure. thank you for your leadership on that. And I, I would hope that also in, including in that is um, because there's uh, assault and harassment, of course, with trans-identified individuals as well as, well as non-gender bina uh, non -gender binary identifying folks. And I would hope that those same protections and naming that and bringing that into the policy discussion is, is just as important because the harassment levels and, and frankly, violence um, against um, folks who don't buy by the gender binary is very true and very real, especially in, in those military spaces. Um, so thank you for your leadership on that. I do have something to say about family leave. Can I take just one minute on family leave? And then, thank you, Barbara. Okay, I promise, I'll try to be one minute left. Um, just, just back to that issue since uh, Jean brought it up. Um, you know, I just want to be clear, the way that that bill came forward and what was sent to the governor, I actually would not have supported um, because it would have passed the weakest family bill law in the country. And as someone who just went, had a child less than a year ago, um, I, I struggled to have family leave um, as a self-employed person and would have benefited from a program, um, a paid family leave program that was universal and provided access for people like me to buy into a disability insurance program. That was not in the bill sent to the governor. And I don't think that Vermonters deserve a weak family leave bill. I think it caused more damage if that had advanced forward. And so I think we can do better. Um, and I want to do better because that is what families, at least like mine, truly need so they don't spend just a month off. I had to go right back to work after a month of having my child last year. So that's very real. Thank you. Um, are there other questions? Okay, no. I'm gonna, I, I have a question. I'd like to step out of my facilitated role a second to ask it because it will be my question for everybody who's running. Um, it, it's clear that we need more housing in this state and particularly affordable housing. Well, what I have identified is a, a triangle that says the way to get affordable housing is to make it easier for developers to build housing of any kind. And the way to get them to do that is to do away or loosen regulations on them, particularly the environmental protection regulations in Act 250. And so I really like to know how um, all of the candidates stand on eliminating or reducing environmental protections for, for things that are built in downtowns. I happen to live in downtown Burlington. And do you really think that that will solve any housing crisis, and particularly the affordable housing crisis, since developers tend not to build affordable housing as it is? Okay, so if you can answer those quickly, um, I'd appreciate it. You, 
Oh, need to unmute. Jean, huh? Jean, 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 why don't you go first? Oh, okay. Go uh, you're absolutely right. Um, and no, they, these they should not be limited. They, these these standards should they they should be improved. What's one the state the the legislature is moving exactly in that direction. A lot of the COVID money, and I'm going to let Earhart do it because this is the master of housing. This is the man. If you want to talk about affordable housing and has a voice for the people and affordable housing in a practical way that gets stuff done, it's Earhart Monica. So I just I will re, I'll just respectfully defer to him on the specifics. But what we are doing is looking at rehabbing housing and also working with the uh, construction industry to up their standards. That's we affordable housing is affordable not cheaply built housing that cost a fortune to run it's got to be safe environmentally sustainable housing so people are living in it are not spending a fortune and wasting you know valuable natural resources and that's we're going we're going in that direction about rehabbing houses and i i think that uh i think the 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 standard business response is oh make it cheaper you know all of these regulations uh, I think you just have to take that with a grain of salt and just stay, stand your ground. And I'm proud that this legislature is doing that. The other thing we really need to have is we need a state registry of rental housing. We inspect rental housing in, in Burlington. We don't in the rest of the state, in many, some cities do, but we, we need that registry. We understood that in Tropical Storm Marlene. So we're working very hard. I work in my committee, I work very hard with uh, um, all of the rehabbing of housing and because that's workforce development. So we're spending a lot of money with the CAP agencies, the community action project agencies on, on upgrading all of the um, weatherization programs because that also is a workforce development plan where people get jobs and that's the beginning of good contracting and a good career in contracting. Thank you. You want to say anything about this, Emma? Yeah, um, my father would literally kill me if I didn't say something about Act 250 because he spent 30 years of his life leading the Central Vermont Act 250. Um, he was a coordinator for that program. Uh, so the way the way um, the coupling of regulation and deregulating somehow being the magical solution for finding a way to affordable housing is a false narrative. Um, when we eliminate protections uh, related to Act 250 that built and and preserve the state that we all love and enjoy. Um, when we when we relax those um, protections, it will change the face of Vermont. It will change what um, people find so valuable and why they want to come live in Vermont and why um, it's so land places like Burlington and even outside of Burlington are um, so valuable. So I would not support um, deregulating Act 250. I think it is um, a really important economic um, driver and investment and protection for our environment. And I also believe that developers will still build they have in Burlington. They still will build. It's a valuable place, at least in this um, this area, um, without those loosening of regulations. We don't have to um, uh, make it easier for them. We can set a standard that benefits our community. We can set a standard that says you are are. It is necessary to build affordable housing. You cannot just build high um, uh, high cost housing for folks because that is a value of our of our, our of our city and of our state. And I agree with Jean on the other issues around. Um, uh, essentially expanding code enforcement and uh, standards of living throughout the rest of the state. It is something that doesn't exist outside of Burlington in any measurable way. And having the increasing the quality of the housing stock is just as important as creating more housing because people are living in dangerous conditions. Um, and also weatherization, I agree there that there's a lot more that the state can do because that also, it's a wraparound issue around uh, making sure people can afford to stay in their house, houses and can afford basic needs like heat and uh, making sure that they're, they're uh, in safe and um, environmentally sound buildings. Thank you both very much. Thank you for your presentations and your answers. Um, I think we're really lucky to have candidates the quality of both of you running. Thanks, thanks for being willing to do it. Okay, we're gonna move on um, to the presentations on the list. And first I have, I, I see he's here now, Phil Baruth. Uh, so what it is you have, I, you have five minutes, Phil, including questions and answers, okay? Okay. Um, so I will just quickly introduce myself, Phil Baruth, one of the Chittenden County delegation, six senators uh, that we send to Montpelier. That will change in two years and we will 
um, break up that Chittenden Six. All the members of the delegation supported that idea, and that will happen right after redistricting. But for now, I'm running with my um, with my colleagues, and I just want to give a shout out to them, and that is Chris Pearson, Jenny Lyons, and Michael Sorotkin. Um, wonderful people to work with. So I, I chair the Senate Education Committee right now, and I, if I can, I just want to take my time to talk about something that Emma mentioned before, and that is the waiting study that came out of the University of Vermont. And it sounds like a dry technical thing, but in Vermont, we don't count students, we count weighted students. In other words, there's a complicated formula whereby we regulate how much we give each district for each student. And that has to do with uh, whether a family is in free or, and reduced lunch status, uh, in other words, needier families, whether or not they are ELL learners, uh, a whole range of things, including whether they're in elementary school or high school, because it's more expensive to educate a high schooler. So that formula hadn't been updated since prior to Act 60. And people very, I think, credibly pushed for an update of that. So I actually, uh, I passed a bill mandating that study, and at the time, the Secretary of Education, uh, who was Rebecca Holcomb, said that she wasn't going to do the study because she just didn't feel that she had the resources. So it took an additional two years, but we finally got the money, got the study done, and it revealed exactly what we thought, which is that students who are English language learners, often from other countries who have come here to live and uh, have their families work in Burlington, they need much more resources than they are getting. And fortunately, the study also found that people in rural communities in Vermont are similarly being underfunded because it's more expensive to educate kids in places where there are very few people. So oddly enough, it formed a working coalition between very rural areas in Vermont and very urban areas in Vermont, like uh, Winooski and Burlington. And so it seemed to me barely possible to be able to pass that. I got it out of my committee on the very day that COVID-19 shut down the state house, and it is now frozen in finance. But that is the number one thing that I wanna work on when I go back. It will be the biggest game changer for Burlington and Winooski, as well as rural areas uh, in the county. So um, that's a, a quick introduction. The only other thing I'll add is that I'm also on the Judiciary Committee and I've been very active in terms of uh, social justice, changes to the correctional system, and eliminating racial disparities in sentencing, eliminating life without parole, and um, I sponsored S-219, which was the excessive force bill that passed uh, just at the end of the last session and um, hopefully the governor will sign in a day or two. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Um, do we have time for some questions, um, Sydney? Anybody yep. with a hand? You only used, um, yeah, there's another minute. Okay, does anybody have a hand up, a question for Phil Baruth? I, I can blather on for another minute if uh, <laughs> I don't see any hands. Okay, black. You have another minute to blather on. I wouldn't call it blathering. All right. Um, I just want to uh, touch on gun safety. It's an issue that I've worked on since 2013. I put in a, an assault weapons ban immediately following the massacre in Sandy Hook. And um, it was a huge Donnybrook back then, seven years ago. Every year, the legislature has grown warmer and warmer to the idea of sensible gun laws. And um, I was able to pass a universal background checks bill a couple of years ago. That was also mentioned earlier. Uh, I believe Erica brought up the fact that the governor actually rethought his position on new gun laws and signed S-55 into law. And so uh, we have a whole series of changes that that made, but it's not enough. And one thing that I wanna do when I go back I have been uh, very concerned with the recent trend under which 
people show up at political gatherings, political protests, state houses, bearing semi-automatic weapons, and they view that as an expression of their rights as gun-owning Americans, I view that as a distinct form of intimidation in the political process. And so I had a bill in that I hope to revive to, to deal with that. Okay, thank you, Phil. Okay, moving on to the next candidate. Is Tom Chastanay here? I don't see him on the participants list. Do you, Sydney? No, I also don't see him on the attendees list. Okay, so then I'm, um, we've heard from Dylan. I'm gonna go on to June Heston. Thank you very much, and thank you for this opportunity. I um, feel like I have a lot of um, work to do on letting people who I know because I haven't spent my career in the political arena. Uh, I am a native Vermonter. I grew up in Graniteville, Vermont, and I was raised by um, World War II vets. Both my mom and dad served in World War II. My mom was a WAC, and my dad was in the Army Air Corps, and uh, they met in New Guinea, got married there, and then came back to Vermont and raised their family in the house that my father grew up on. So I grew up on a farm in poverty, and my parents worked hard. Um, they were very involved in the community. They were involved with the March of Dimes uh, because they lost their oldest son at age eight to polio about six months before the polio vaccine came out. And um, they were also very involved in the Democratic Party. And I remember when I was about six, Governor Hoff was at our house. We were hand making Hoff for governor signs on our kitchen table. And uh, one of our, um, one of my parents' friends had a farm and he had donkeys. So he brought a donkey down. So there was a photo shoot. <laughs> And I didn't know then that that was interesting <laughs> to have the governor in your driveway for a photo shoot. Um, but that was my introduction really to um, service. And so my, my life has really been devoted to that. I went to school here in Vermont. I went to North University and then to St. Michael's College. And I have, then I started my career in higher education and then I started working for nonprofits. I was the CEO of the Make-A-Wish Foundation of Vermont, and then Vermont Family Network, and then the Chill Foundation, which is Burton Snowboard's nonprofit, working with um, underserved youth across North America. And we also got programs going in Japan and um, in Europe. So my whole career has been focused on serving others. I, you know, have worked with youth and families who are struggling with the healthcare system, um, they're struggling with affordable housing. Um, they're struggling with um, access to, you know, equal education. And so I, I know what that looks like. And it was me. I remember thinking we were lucky that I got free hot lunch. I didn't know we were poor. Um, and it, it took me until probably middle school to figure that out when we didn't get new clothes for the first day of school when other kids did. Um, I married the love of my life, um, Mike, and we, um, we settled here in Richmond. Um, we've been here 26 years ago, we built our house. And he was someone who also gave his life um, to service. He was a Vermont State Trooper for 26 years, and he was in the military for 33 years, most of which um, he was in the Marine Corps first and then uh, in the Vermont Army National Guard, and he achieved uh, the rank of Brigadier General, and he served as our Deputy Adjutant General for a few years until he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, which was deemed a result of his exposure to toxins from the burn pits in Afghanistan. And so he, he took uh, a medical um, retirement and then passed away about four months later. He worked through about two and a half years of treatment. So during the process of the legislation that was uh, introduced last year regarding burn pit exposure, I was very involved in testifying and now I'm working with a group of 30 veterans, um, veterans organizations and nonprofits who are working on federal legislation. And we've met with members of Congress a couple of times until COVID hit. So that sort of sparked my interest in now wanting to serve a broader audience in Vermont. And so that led me here. And, and I 
feel like I have a lot to learn, but I have learned a lot in this process. I, I believe that our top priority needs to be the economic recovery because you know, COVID has devastated a number of industries, but more importantly, individuals. And so we have a lot of work to do. And not only do I think we don't have all the answers, I'm not sure we have all the questions. I think we've never been here before. And I think we need to be doing a lot of listening because I feel like there is a lot to learn from the constituents. And those are the people we need to talk to. You know, if we had issues with affordable housing before COVID, those are bigger issues now. If we had issues with access to healthcare, we know those are bigger issues now. I think this pandemic has also given us an opportunity to let, you know, right. what we were doing before, how we've changed and we changed quickly because of crisis. We, Telehealth was predicted to take five years to figure out if that was going to work. Well, it had to work because we were in a crisis. So now we have this opportunity to look at how we've done things, how we right. have done things, and can we move it more quickly. So is that okay. it? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next on, the, um, there's really not time for questions, but maybe there will be afterwards, okay? Um, next on the list, I have Louis Myers, but I don't see. He, so he's on his phone, and I'm going to allow him to talk right now. He should be able to um, speak. Can you? Okay, Louis, oh, you so have. Can, if you can hear me. We can hear you. Okay, five okay, minutes. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, thanks. I'm, this is Louis, I'm Louis Myers. I'm a, um, live in South Burlington, occupations physician. I uh, grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, started my professional career as a social worker, got a master's degree in social work from Catholic University, and then worked for several years as a probation officer in, in D.C., um, and then worked also as a case manager with HIV patients. Went back to medical school and residency uh, in internal medicine, and then went immediately after into primary care and had my own practice for many years, and then moved to Vermont about seven or eight years ago. And I've worked at Rutland Regional Hospital as one of their hospital-based physicians for seven years. So I wanted to take just these few minutes to talk about healthcare because I think clearly that is on people's minds. We are in the healthcare crisis of our lifetime uh, for our community, for our state, for our country, for the world. I think we can take some comfort and some pride in Vermont and the way we have uh, taken on the COVID virus. Uh, the story is not finished but I think we're doing an exceptional job and I think uh, it's not going unnoticed around the country. But before COVID began and after COVID ends, we have been struggling with our healthcare system here in Vermont, uh, trying to find a way forward to keep people insured, to keep people healthy. And I think we've taken the wrong path. Uh, in 2016, as a parting gift, uh, former Governor Peter Shumlin uh, passed the, uh, and the legislature passed what's called the One Care all payer plan, which is essentially a for profit HMO, which is based at the university, administered through the University of Vermont Medical Center. And over the last four years, uh, this has cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And all of the indices are now that it is failing on all of its major goals, which include, include increasing access, decreasing costs, and increasing the quality of care. Uh, the problem is that it is uh, run by a conglomerate. Uh, University of Vermont Medical Center, which has already established a monopoly in Vermont and has previously driven up prices. Um, I favor uh, independent hospitals and in independent medical practices whenever possible. I think the studies consistently show that they not only uh, deliver more personalized care, but at far less cost. The um, all the uh, Green Mountain Care Board is one of the is a rather unique regulatory agency we have here in Vermont, which is supposed to be helping control prices, uh, but they have uh, not been able to keep the cost of uh, health care down. And in fact, now, unfortunately, are serving more as reformer, uh, excuse me, cheerleaders rather than regulators for one care. Too many Vermonters are, are underinsured. I think we do a fairly good job at providing at least a basic insurance, but underinsured in the sense that their uh, deductibles are unaffordable. Uh, excuse me, their premiums are unaffordable and their deductibles and co-pays keep them from uh, going for even the most basic care. Uh, 
I believe in talking to people around Chittenden County and around the, the state that more people are interested in exploring a single payer plan uh, or at least a public option to buy into a government run single payer plan. I uh, uh, would add that we uh, have not had a position in the state Senate in 37 years. Uh, we have one position in the, in the House of Representatives, Dr. Till, who was mentioned earlier. Um, we have no positions in the Green Mountain Care Board. And I think that's been a big problem as we've tried to, I think that's one reason why uh, one care passed, frankly. Uh, the legislature, a few people in Vermont even knew what it was, and the legislators I've spoken to, they don't really understand the plan. Um, I can promise you that if I'm on the health care committee in January and some of the high priced uh, officials from the University of Vermont Medical Center testify, they will not be leaving the hearing room until they answer some questions. Right now, they are, uh, our state auditor, Doug Hopper, has found that they have been uh, less than the information we need to make sure that our state money is being uh, uh, spent wisely. So I would like to use my experience as a physician. I think being a physician does not automatically make you a good legislator, but I think being a good physician means that you use knowledge, compassion, and common sense. And I think that's a good place to start as a legislator in Montpelier. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, you, you, um, do you have one minute for questions? Is that what you were saying, Sydney? 20 seconds is the remaining time. Okay, so then we'll just push on. Um, the next person is Steve May. Hi, folks. Can you hear me? Now we can, yes. Okay, fantastic. So thanks for the opportunity for, for, for me to be able to share a little bit about myself. Um, so I, I've really had a, a lifetime of service, and uh, my running for state senate is just a continuation of what I feel like has been um, Part of that journey. I was fortunate enough to have served in the New York State Senate in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks on, on the World Trade Center. I was a legislative fellow to a senator from Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, and worked with folks that lost folks at Ground Zero. Um, in terms of my more local experience, I've been a past member of the executive board of the Vermont AFL-CIO. And uh, I've also been fortunate enough to have been a past uh, vice president of the Central Labor Council here in, in uh, the Champlain Valley. Um, I am a mental health provider. I'm a clinical social worker. And I've got 15 years experience working in, in mental health i uh, run my own practice. I have done agency work. I've done community mental health. Uh, I've worked at a methadone clinic. Um, I, I get the pleasure of working with addicts, alcoholics, and their families. And I have had a front row seat for the carnage that goes along with the opiate crisis and dealing with the fallout every day. And I will bring that experience with me if I'm fortunate enough to serve. Um, I took a sabbatical from my mental health practice and was lucky enough to be the first, uh, the director of advocacy for the New England Hemophilia Association, which meant that I was responsible for the public policy uh, work of the six New England states at our chapter in uh, suburban Boston. And then I picked up a promotion and wound up the director of state affairs for the Hemophilia Federation of America and picked up the other 44 chapter organizations around the country running their policy shop at the state level, um, which was incredibly fulfilling work coming out of the bad blood era in the late 90s. Um, that led me to 
um, start my own nonprofit uh, organization called the Forum on Genetic Equity, which dealt with genetic bias issues. Um, it's, it's still a concern today, even though the nonprofit has uh, been shut down. And um, closer to home, I've had the pleasure to be both a school board member in Bolton, and I've been a select board member in Richmond, where I now reside. I share this with you to just illustrate that um, the depth and width and breadth of experience that I would bring to Montpelier on day one, if I am in fact fortunate enough to serve. Uh, in terms of an agenda that I'm running on, th there are really three, three major concerns that I am championing at this point. They are universal basic income, uh, universal primary care, and initiative to the legislature. I believe that largely we need a refresh. We need a reset in terms of how Montpelier works. I think that there is a deep frustration amongst voters about how the legislature does its work and that it's time to see substantive change and that that conversation needs to be brokered. And so I'm, I'm happy to start that process. Uh, there, is one, there is one other concern um, that I care very deeply about. Um, my wife and I adopted a child through DCF and having gone through the process of being foster parents, um, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Uh, having dealt with DCF and having gone through the legal process, there are substantive changes that need to happen. And as part of that experience, uh, in my clinical practice, I developed a, a subspecialty around adoption, infertility, and surrogacy. Um, I'm happy to speak about it at greater length, but I can tell you that um, it was a, a three-year journey that was uh, frankly miserable. And with that having been said, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker on the list is Chris Pearson. Good evening, right everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. <clears throat> um, I hope I'm familiar to many of you. Uh, Nice to see your faces tonight. Uh, prior to being in the Senate, as many of you know, I representative uh, I represented part of the Old North End wards one and two in the legislature for uh, eight plus years. Um, and since 2016, I've been proud to be one of the six senators. I um, approached the legislature not as somebody who's dying to be a politician or. Uh, aching for a career in politics, but really as somebody that sees the political process as something that belongs to the people, that is uh, in some sense, not quite corrupted in Vermont, I wouldn't go that far, but has been taken over by people that do not frankly reflect the community. If you look at age breakdown, the gender breakdown, the income breakdown uh, of people that uh, we serve with in Montpelier, you don't find the average Vermonter is terribly well represented. And uh, like a, a lot of people uh, with a progressive background, sort of the step one is, hey, our uh, elected representatives ought to better reflect our community. I remain uh, just a little bit shy of 50, one of the youngest senators, which is rather shocking and not great. Um, in my career, in the House and the Senate, I have focused on uh, trying to stretch the debate, trying to broaden the issues that we can put on the table and what legislators would consider realistic. Uh, and uh, always with my home in the Old North End in mind. So uh, when it came to minimum wage, Peter Shumlin and uh, the Speaker of the House at that point was talking about 1010, Barack Obama was talking about 1010, I introduced a $15 minimum wage bill. Uh, just last year over the veto of the governor, we managed to 
inch it up to 1255 in a year and a half from now. Um, so those kinds of economic issues, poverty issues have been central to my work. Uh, these days we're seeing it bear out in many ways, especially in food security. We should not be living in a state of Vermont where we tolerate a single family going without food during this pandemic or otherwise. Um, and I've been proud of the work. We, we uh, all of us in the, in the legislature managed to put in money of CARES money, relief, COVID relief money towards food security. Uh, I also am the vice chair of the Senate Ag Committee where I've focused a lot on getting local foods into schools and diversifying our agricultural economy so that we're less dependent on dairy and frankly, um, more able to take care of ourselves. When we look at food security and food crossing the oceans and crossing the country to reach us in Vermont, um, there clearly is a problem at the same time we have an ag sector that is struggling to earn a living. And, and so somewhere there's gotta be a connection. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention climate change. In 2012, I was one of the co-founding members of the Climate Solutions Caucus, Legislative Climate Solutions Caucus. Therein, by the way, lies a real tie to agriculture. Again, trying to elevate an important issue that I think resonates with Vermonters, but was not getting the attention it deserved in Montpelier. Um, and I'm pleased to see that we've made some inroads there, including just two weeks ago, the Senate passing the 24 votes, uh, the Global Warming Solutions Act, sending it back to the House. We've got to get that to the governor. That is a planning document for how we're going to meet the Paris goals and beyond. Um, when it comes to housing, my, um, my uh, strategy has been to talk to Earhart Monka and figure out what the Affordable Housing Coalition is asking for and give it everything I've got. They do great work and we have a long way to go. Uh, I've been proud to back up Senator Bruth on gun control. I have a, a good history of uh, pushing for accountability for police reform, getting citizen voices into oversight roles. Just a few weeks ago, we did pass a, a mandate that the Par Department of Public Safety come back in August with a uh, a strategy to reduce funding for police and increase that money into mental health. I've taken on pharma, I've taken on corporate powers. I, I focus deeply on economic inequality. It's been a great honor to work uh, for you and fight for you in the Senate and I'd be glad to have your support in August. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next would be Keisha Ram. I don't see her on the participant list, however. Um, would you check me on that, Sydney? Keisha, I don't, I don't see her. Okay, then I'm going to move on. Um, Erica Reddick is next. I'd like to give Erica an extra 30 seconds or so because she didn't get to address her issue around a separation of powers before, okay? Uh, thank you very much, Barbara. That is very generous of you. I really appreciate it. Um, I, my name is Erica Reddick. I'm a resident of Ward 4, that's the new north end of Burlington. Uh, I am a fortunate owner of my grandparents' triplex that they had built in 1963. So uh, it's where my mom grew up, uh, spent a lot of time in Burlington, went to Lyman C. Hunt, and I'm very vested in uh, making sure that Burlington and Vermont uh, actually return to affordability and return to a place where the middle class can raise their families, raise their children, educate them, uh, and be safe and secure and not have to worry uh, about public safety as we are starting to see now. So some of my major policy um, initiatives are going to be around the economy. So everything to me is sort of centers around the economy. If we have a group of people, if we have a population of people who have good jobs and the ability to make good money, take care of themselves, take care of their families, a lot of these other problems start to work themselves out. And as we build that, um, that wealth and that economy here in Vermont, we're going to have the money that we need to pay for all of the initiatives that I've heard people talking about this evening. Uh, one of the things that I love about Vermonters and uh, being from Vermont is how much people actually really care uh, about the environment. 
they care about their neighbors, they care about their schools, they want people to be happy and healthy, and people really are engaged in their community. And what I found in my experience is that the best way to facilitate people's ability to participate in their community and really build up those, those resources that we need to address things like the opioid crisis and um, other systemic issues that we have in the system is making sure that people have enough. And while the answer always seems to be to raise taxes, um, our current administration and legislature don't seem to understand that as we raise taxes and raise regulations and fees and things like that, the more it costs to run a business, to build things, uh, and to get by. And businesses and people leave. They're leaving. You know, I think most people know that we have a negative population growth in the state of Vermont. Um, and that the only people moving in, or the majority of the people moving in, are, are wealthy uh, and they're remote workers. And while that's great, and that's a great tax base, what we need are jobs and the middle income infrastructure to make sure that people are okay. Uh, I, I believe right now in Vermont, the, the, the uh, statistic, at least before COVID, was 50% of folks we're on some kind of state assistance and 50% were working. And that's just not sustainable if we wanna pay for all of the things that we wanna pay for. We have to make sure that there are businesses who can thrive and succeed. And so my uh, policies are gonna be about, let's get some businesses in here that uh, can generate some revenue and make it possible to have these things happen. Uh, another big issue, I, uh, I really care about is our schools. Um, you know, I, I don't think a lot of people understand. So 75% of our property taxes go towards our schools, but that's not the only funding mechanism. It also comes from sales tax, meals and use tax, and a number of other taxes and fees that are raised around the state, which have been demolished with COVID. So we're gonna be facing a huge shortfall in school funding, uh, not to mention how much Act 46 has really just has has really just put an iron yoke on our schools around the state and really harmed uh, the ability for localities to get good educators, good education in their areas. And I think it was mentioned earlier, the mechanism for the funding really is is often taking from poor communities and giving it to more affluent communities who just provide more services. And that's really unfair that one, places one like, Ch I, thank you. It's really unfair that places like Chittenden County get more funding when we're actually more affluent. I think it's really important that we have a look at the ways that we've created inequity in our system rather than solved it. So I wanna make sure I honor my time. And uh, just my last little thing is, uh, it's really okay to say that we don't care about separation of powers when it's your team that's in the legislature, but eventually it's not going to be your team. And you're not going to like it when the minority has the ability to overrun the majority with their policies because gridlock is intentional and built into the system. So thank you very much. Appreciate you letting me be here. Thank you, Erica. Um, the next speaker is Adam Roof. Um, hello, everybody, and, and thank you for the, the Wards 2-3 steering committee for, for putting this on. Um, it, it's a shame that we have to do this over Zoom. I think the 2-3 the, the neighborhood dinner is one of the, the best things going in, in Burlington uh, community politics, and so it's a bummer that we're not all uh, snacking together, but I, I suppose the Zoom call is the new norm. Um, I'd love to spend five minutes talking about uh, separation of powers, but I, I'm going to restrict myself from doing that. Um, I think you know maybe most on the call uh, are familiar with me, but for those who are not, I'll just do a quick introduction, talk about a few core issues, and then just talk a little bit about why I'm committed to, um, to public service. Um, I'm, I don't come from Vermont. Uh, I come from Massachusetts, and that might not be the typical way of starting off uh, uh, comments when you're running for state legislature, but uh, I do that because um, we, we need to be thinking about uh, how our how our communities are welcoming to more to more people and and how we're going to grow in the Vermont way 
and how we're going to have more people uh, be willing to come and be a part and be included in our in our communities. Um, it's, it's something that I think a lot about. It's part of who I am. Um, I grew up in a small business family. My, my parents are in a small restaurant and uh, residential construction, two sectors that are, are taking a beating through this pandemic. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about, about small businesses and, and the people and the workers that make small businesses function. Um, and then lastly, uh, for those that don't know, I did serve on the Burlington City Council for five years, which was uh, a, a true privilege to, to serve the community that has given me so much. Uh, during those five years, I, I, I was active, very active in, in my role there. Uh, I served as chair of the Community Development and Neighborhood Revitalization Committee. I, I chaired the Public Safety Committee for many years, working on a range of public safety issues, including policing. Um, and you know, maybe I'll use that as a segue into some of the main issues that I've been focusing on and, and with less than maybe two minutes left, I'll, I'll move relatively quickly. Um, and I'll talk about, about justice reform and policing. You know, it was, it was May 1st or May 2nd of, of last year that I got a call from, um, from a fellow city councilor at the time who said, you really need to see these videos that seven days are circulating from the, turned out being the BPD officers, um, what, what I would qualify as acting inappropriately. Um, and that would probably be a, 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 an overly nice way of saying it. Uh, really assaulting some young black men in our community. And, and, and as chair of the Public Safety Committee, I took on the challenge of organizing a, a group to, to, to put together a, an action committee, a special committee on policing. Uh, that was probably the most difficult thing that I had to, to do as a, as a city councilor, bringing together people that had active disagreement um, around an issue that was very sensitive. And I think that that was uh, something that uh, with real hands in the dirt type ex experience I'd like to bring to the legislature, building coalitions um, of people with different ideas around issues that are absolutely critical. Uh, we need to be doing that not just with policing, but also with how we prosecute and how we pr uh, imprison um, our, our community members. And, and I'll, I'll move on from, from justice reform to environmentalism, which I think should start to less so be a, a campaign platform point, but more so as a philosophy that's integrated into everything that we do. Um, I think that Burlington does a good job in it. I think that Chittenden County is a leader statewide. I think we do need to make progress elsewhere. And I like to talk about environmentalism, not just as something we need to do to regress climate change, which we absolutely must, but we also need to look at how we can be environmental in our economic development strategies. I, I run BTV Ignite, a local nonprofit that does uh, economic and community development in the tech sector um, with workforce development programs and small business investments. Uh, the way that I think about the tech sector is that is a low footprint sector. It is a sustainable sector that has good high paying jobs. Um, and it's also, if we work hard at it, like I do with BTV Ignite, we can create more pathways for those who have historically not been um, involved in that sort of sector. And, and so if we can look at environmentalism as something to address climate change as well as an opportunity for sustainable, clean economic development, we can start to address um, many problems at once in an integrated and intersectional way. Uh, the last thing that I'll, that I'll see in someone- Let's turn one minute. Is that, is that one minute? Yep. Or my, one my time minute left. Up? One minute left, all right, I'll go quick. Um, you know, when I talk about economic development, um, I also talk about workforce training. When I talk about workforce training, I talk about education. And I don't think that uh, Vermont does enough to focus on the full range of what education uh, needs to be thought of. I think zero to five is a critical uh, time in, in a family's life or a child's life that we can do more in. I was proud to help design the early learning initiative that Burlington put together in 2017 or 18. And we've seen already the benefits of that program. We should be looking at zero to five um, as part of how we educate and support our families certainly more investments in our education system. When you look back historically, how have communities and states gotten through recessions or depressions? It's investing in their education system and investing in their workforce development training and, and job retraining, which we're going to desperately need, particularly in the sector of uh, the service sector where that represents as of May, uh, half of the 40,000 jobs that, have, that remain uh, lost um. in, in right now. So uh, investments in those sectors I think are important. Um, I think my time is up, so I'll, I'll hold off there, but let's take any questions when the time comes. Thank you so much. Okay, Adam, thank you. Yep. And the next speaker I have is David Shear. 
Thank you uh, very much for having me here today. And, and I want to extend my thanks to the Ward 23 NPA. I'm sure I speak for all the candidates when I say that we are grateful for the opportunity to get together, at least virtually, and talk to community members about why we're involved in the race. Um, you know, the reason why I'm involved in the race really stems from the formative experience in my professional life, which was my work as a public defender. And I did that work in here in Chittenden County and also actually all around the state and had a view of some of the challenges that the most vulnerable Vermonters face uh, and the uh, very low income Vermonters face and some of the obstacles that are present. And it gave me a real insight into the work that I've been doing more recently around criminal justice reform and as a motivator and driver for me. And it also gave me a lot of insight into the economic challenges and the necessity of economic opportunity, uh, economic justice and affordability, um, and some of the intersecting environmental um, initiatives that we need to take on if we're going to have a holistic approach to the problems that people face. I think especially as we are emerging from, or will be hopefully emerging from a serious economic downturn, we need people present in the legislature who have a real understanding of the challenges that are out there. You know, I'll just talk uh, for briefly about the criminal justice system and some of the work I've been doing with respect to that. I think one thing that's not super well known is that 85% of all people who pass through our criminal system in Vermont are appointed a public defender, meaning that we have uh, very low income uh, individuals coming through the, the criminal system almost exclusively. And we have a system that polices and prosecutes the poor. But what's really going on here is we have a system that is failing to address the underlying reasons why people get involved in the first place. Um, that's poverty, substance use disorder, mental health issues. And on top of that, we have a system that it fails to keep us safe. It fails by its own terms because it isn't addressing those underlying issues. Uh, we are seeing high rates of reoffense. You know, in the last few years, I've been working as an assistant attorney general, really focusing on making change to the system. Uh, that's included bail reform, uh, increasing access to expungement so people who haven't had issues for a while can get out from under the burden of a, of a record and have much more economic opportunity and stability, and increasing restorative justice programming and diversion programs, more than doubling them and, and keeping thousands of Vermonters uh, out of the regular system and giving them a chance to succeed. Um, and I'm proud of that work and I've also, I also understand in building those programs that you can't solve all the ills of the criminal system uh, from inside the system. You have to take a broader look and look at the economic inequities uh, and economic challenges that people face. One of the other issues that really motivates me and drives me is affordability in Chittenden County. Um, that is such a obstacle to people who are trying to succeed on all income levels from, well, I shouldn't say all income levels, but certainly low income and middle income individuals. Um, I talk to business owners who will say that we are essentially exporting jobs in Chittenden County because it's so difficult to find affordable housing. I know from the work that I've done working with low income clients who would be much better off if they could get to the, village, the downtowns and the places like Chittenden County, the places within Chittenden County where there are a lot of jobs, simply can't do it well, because it can't achieve that because um, affordability is a, is a block. They can't, they can't get there. And so I'm a strong proponent of uh, growth and making sure that we have housing of all kinds from permanent affordable housing to environmentally responsible growth of all kinds focused in downtowns and village centers. Uh, one other aspect of that that's very interrelated is our public transportation system. Um, that's both an environmental concern, environmental priority, and it's also an anti-poverty in, uh, initiative. Uh, so many people who are stuck in difficult circumstances are there in part because of the unreliability of private vehicles. And we need to do a better job of allowing for well, uh, everybody to have access to public transportation, both on the environmental front. I mean, in Vermont, your average Vermonter uses a lot more carbon in commuting than say somebody in New York City, even though we think of ourselves as being a much greener place. Uh, and we need to focus on that issue for, on both those fronts. Um, 
And the final thing I'll say in the last minute is I, I think we really need to focus on an investment in recovery. I think there can often be a reaction in, in difficult times to move towards austerity and to uh, reducing government investment. And I think that's exactly the wrong thing to do. I understand we face difficult choices and challenges, but we need to have uh, governance in Montpelier that is focused on investment and making sure that we are a backstop for the economy and for our working people. Um, time. And I will I thank you all very much for your time and I will leave it right there. Okay, um, thank you very much, um, David. And um, we write at 8.30 when we said we wanted to adjourn. However, I am willing to hold the meeting open for another 15 minutes or so if people have questions for any of the candidates. Um, it, first of all, if anybody has any objection to that, speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, if not, um, Sydney, uh, can you see if anybody is raising their hands with questions? No one right now. Okay. Oh, uh, actually, um, Michael Sorotkin was supposed to be the next speaker. I didn't see him on the list. Is he on the list? I don't see him on our list. On our and, list. and Keisha Ram has not um, arrived either, right? I, I don't see. I don't see her. Okay. Okay, seeing no questions, I will um, again pose my question about the connection between affordable housing, eliminating environmental standards under 250, Act 250 for downtowns and um, developers' wishes. And I'd like, to, I'd like anybody to answer that, but particularly Erhard Mankey, because people have deferred to you as the affordable housing expert. So I'd like to hear from the affordable housing expert. Thanks, Barbara. Um, I try not to think of myself as an expert, though I have been working in the field for over 30 years, and I totally appreciate the shout out from Senator Peterson and from uh, Representative Sullivan. Um, yeah, there, that is a false dichotomy. Um, there is no reason that uh, you need to uh, think about housing and environmental protections and environmental responsibility and sustainability in uh, opposite, uh, opposite terms. And in fact, Vermont has been a leader on that for well over 30 years. Um, early on in my involvement with housing, uh, the state of Vermont created uh, something called the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And think of housing and conservation uh, both together. Uh, housing advocates and conservation advocates uh, that wanted to protect Vermont's important open lands, uh, our agricultural heritage, our farms, our important natural spaces got together and persuaded the legislature in the late 80s and then Governor Madeline Cunin and her administration to create what we refer to as the VHCD, Vermont Housing Conservation Board. It is not a contradiction at all. And our affordable housing developers that are funded through that, as well as some uh, for-profit developers that have also uh, um, gained access to affordable housing funds to provide affordable housing, um, develop in and around our downtowns and our village centers in order to maintain those open spaces and protect our, our agricultural heritage and our farm and forestry economy, which is such a huge part of, uh, of, Vermont's, uh, of Vermont's economy for, for working Vermonters. Um, in terms of Act 250, uh, folks who are following the process or, you know, serving currently know that they're, um, in fact, uh, Senator Sorotkin's committee uh, created a, an omnibus housing bill that addressed some of those Act 250 issues. There is some duplication. We have very sophisticated development review processes in places like Burlington, for instance, um, where um, the Act 250 process is not necessarily um, one of the things that helps protect our environment. Um, our development review process uh, is, is good for that. Um, so in uh, designated downtowns and in so-called neighborhood development areas, um, uh, we want to encourage development in those places. And developers will tell you that in uh, some situations where there's uh, duplication of local and uh, uh, regional uh, review processes, that costs money, uh, it increases risk, um, and it discourages the kind of development that we want uh, in our downtowns and in our village centers. I'll, I'll stop there. I don't want to the conversation uh, but um, yeah
I would just say that local, the reason we need this state is that local processes, which seem to be duplicative, are fraught with conflicts of interest in local politics. That's why we need the state, which is removed from that, to continue to protect us from, um, you know, possibly predatory developers and um, cities that are now themselves cutting back on the protections because of pressures from the development community. So I, I just thought I would mention that. Erica has her hand raised. I'd like to go ahead and answer as well. Um, I agree that there definitely should be some protections in place for our environment. I think we can all agree that those are important. I. As a matter of fact, got my parents to start recycling back in the 80s in Milton when it was not a thing. So I'm gonna take credit for that. Uh, but in all seriousness, um, the problem with affordable housing is it's a, not the environmental impact that we wanna be careful of, because obviously we do. Um, but most economists, even very liberal economists agree that minimum housing, affordable, affordable housing units often end up driving up the cost of housing. And so my concern about affordability is less about, um, are we making sure that we're being responsible in our building and more about, are we having responsible policy that actually gets us the ends that justify the means? And whenever you require a builder to have a number of affordable housing units, what happens is, the other units in the building then have to be more expensive to cover the cost. And in Burlington and in Vermont generally, well, actually I'll speak to Vermont in particular since we're at the NPA meeting, we don't just have state guidelines. Our guidelines go well above and beyond what they are at the state level to the point where they're unconstitutional and against the law. And so the city is regularly uh, in litigation with landlords because they they pass policies that are unconstitutional and against the law and so again that raises the cost of housing i can tell you in my own case that 1963 triplex the city has been trying to force us to turn it into a duplex for the last 18 months to the tune of about twenty thousand dollars in attorney fees so in case anybody is curious why rent is so high that's one good reason uh, I would be happy to do a number of the environmental upgrades. And in fact, that was our intention to do with renovations last year. But the city uh, doesn't want a 60-year-old triplex to remain a triplex. They're trying to force uh, the fifth generation of family to renovate the house. So you can see that a lot of the affordable housing issues are not just regulation. They're not just environmental. They are government overreach policy overreach and overregulation. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to weigh in on this or anything else? Yeah, Adam. I'm um, sorry. I, I let you do it, Sydney. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I stopped myself from talking about uh, separation of powers, but I'm, I'm going to indulge and talk a little bit about affordable housing. And, you know, I, I think you bring up a good point, Barbara, um, around the, the uh, you know, Act 250 and, and, the, and the different processes that are, are in place. And, I think that you know one thing that I love about Vermont, and I think that one of the greatest things about Vermonters is that we tend to want to fix things that aren't working. And when things don't make sense, or when they're clearly not working for um, you know working for the community, whether it's through data or stories, uh, and I think there's plenty of stories and statistics that we can look at uh, in our housing market that that points to this. Um, before politics, we try to be pragmatic, and I think that one of the best things we could do is to is to eliminate the dupli the, the, the duplicative processes around review. Um, you know, I've, I've, I'm generally a proponent for local control, but not always. I do think that there's an opportunity to improve how the how the review is done. But I also want to reject and push back on the notion that it's that it's only environmental high environmental building standards that are leading to our affordability crisis. Is it a contributor? probably at some, at some small portion, but I think the forces of our market are, are far more impacted by other things 
namely our, our unwillingness to want to consider what long-term growth looks like in our community. Um, some people call it smart growth. Some people call it sustainable growth. I look at it as a necessity from an affordability standpoint. Uh, and we can do growth the Vermont way. We can do it in a right-sized manner. And I think before we go down that path, because the conversation about growth in Vermont is one that has to be done the right way, we need to look at the housing market from, from truly the entirety of what the marketplace is, which I think of it as homelessness to high end. And if we're not doing what we, we need to be doing at each sector or each section of that, of that spectrum, then we're losing out. Uh, we do generally a good job in Chittenden County supporting the homeless and finding them transitional housing. Um, we generally do a good job with policies like the inclusionary zoning ordinances that handles this, um, you know, the 60% AMI uh, level. We, the, the high end marketplace tends to take care of itself. I do think where we're missing um, is a, a focus on that middle income, that workforce housing. I don't think we focus enough there. I do think that there is a hole in our housing market that you can, you know, if you qualify for an IZ unit or a, an affordable unit, that is, that's helpful. It does push the cost onto other people. We need to have programs in place that are providing uh, the workforce and, and middle market uh, housing opportunities. And that's not just with rent. We need to find ways to build condos, build more properties that young people can find their way into, not just for all the benefits that are coming with a stable home, but also the, the, the wealth that's generated. Owning a home is still one of the best pathways to long-term wealth and breaking generational poverty. And in Vermont right now, if you're a 30-something or a 20-something, you cannot afford to buy a house. Certainly not in Burlington, probably not in Chittenden County. And that is one of the driving factors that's pushing people out of our communities. And we need to be more inclusive as we think about these things. So thank you for that, that question and, and thanks for letting me indulge a little bit. Thank you. Um, Molly, so has, uh, Molly has a question. Okay, Molly. Hi, I wound up with questions. I did not hear a lot of people talk about racial justice in your platforms. I'm wondering as state leaders, what you think about state reparations. Anybody uh, want to weigh in on that? I'd be, I'd be happy to speak as a state representative. Dylan? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say, um, my apologies if you didn't catch it earlier. We had a conversation, and I know we touched on a lot in a very short amount of time. So thank you for sticking with us here. Um, I actually think it's appropriate now to begin to look at the systems we have, how they have disadvantaged uh, people of color, and I think it is time to enter into a process first of reconciliation, formal reconciliation as a state, as well as explore opportunities where we can provide reparations. The key area that I see right off the bat, it's, it's actually appropriate in this conversation, is around housing. If you look at federal housing laws, the discrimination that has been allowed to happen historically, that's an area where state policy has an overlay. And we need to begin to think about how all of our systems, all of them, have contributed to this marginalization because it's put people further behind. I had someone say to me the other day, they were sort of illustrating the situation here. And really what we have is we have a, you know, we have a situation where perhaps a white person in Vermont might start on third base, but a person of color might actually be starting on first. And as a society, it's time for us as policymakers to accept it, address it, listen to the voices of those who have been marginalized and take action. So I actually think it's appropriate to begin that conversation. And as a state legislator, uh, both in the House right now, uh, I feel that way. And if elected to the state Senate, it's something I would want to work on. Understanding that we need to do a better job as an institution in the legislature of listening, of allowing those voices to lead the actual debate. Because if you look at the makeup of the General Assembly, and we dealt with some bills recently, we've either been rushing through them or the makeup has not actually always represented the voices who have uh, cast the votes and elected us to be there. So this is a partnership. We need to do better and we need to work together. Thank you, Dylan. Um, just a few more minutes if anybody wants to weigh in on the question of reparations. I'll, I'll jump in. Oh. 
for it. Um, um, it's hard if you don't do virtual hands, but I see Edward and then um, David. I'll be brief. Um, Molly. Uh, David and Chris, I think we have to stop. Molly, thanks for the question. I'm, I'm blind. Earhart. Thanks for the question, Molly. Um, sorry if you didn't hear my uh, intro earlier, but, you know, as a father of a young black man, I, you know, we had the talk. Um, we, uh, I got to pick him up at the police station uh, when he got targeted by the police. I, I understand uh, how um, in, in many ways that, you know, most of my uh, white friends and colleagues uh, may not have had that personal level of experience with the kind of discrimination that, um, especially young black men, but young black women um, uh, all are subject to. Uh, I totally think that reparations is something that needs to be discussed. I completely agree with everything that Bill and Bill and said, and thank you for that, um, Bill. And uh, you know, one of the things that we forget, we always think that you know slavery was in the South and it built the economy of the South. Well, you know, our New England mills uh, spun that cotton, and uh, the wealth of New England, uh, the traditional wealth of New England, in large part, is also due to um, the sweat and the slave labor of uh, our uh, African American friends ancestors. So I think it's it's time for that discussion to happen here. And I think we need to continue the bottom to top review of our state laws and policies uh, with a racial justice lens and continue the work on police uh, reform and police practices that were begun in the General Assembly this year. Okay. Um, David, Chris, and Adam, I think, wants to weigh in. Thank you very much. And I, I won't reiterate what has already been very nicely said by both Dylan and Erhard. Uh, I just add one aspect that I've been working on and have been able to been pleased to be able to help some of our leaders of color on is racial disparities in our criminal and juvenile justice system. We have one of the most disparate rates of incarceration for black people in the nation. About 1.5% of our population is black and 8.5% 8, 8 of the population in our jails is black, which again puts us, I think, around fourth or fifth in the country in terms of racial disparities. We have a lot of work to do on that. A couple of things that I think we need to do specifically are changing our sentencing laws to, frankly, I'll say it bluntly, reduce the discretion of prosecutors and judges to make the uh, sentences more consistent. And secondly, I think we also need, we have been gathering data about what police do, not enough, but we started doing that. Uh, we need to start gathering data about how prosecutors are making decisions and how judges are making decisions. It's largely a closed box uh, once somebody gets into court um, to the time that they are sentenced. We just don't have data to see how people are being treated disparately and where those disparate um, decisions are being made. And we really need to scrutinize the lawyers the, uh, who are involved in that system. The lawyers have escaped scrutiny too much. I say this as a lawyer myself, um, and we need to scrutinize them as part of the process to getting towards equal justice. Okay, Chris? Just quickly, because I know we don't have much time. Uh, you know, I hope Vermont can begin a, a discussion around reparations. I think it needs to be a national conversation. And uh, we have at many times been national leaders pushing hard conversations. I think closer to home in, in a more immediate way, uh, building on what David is saying, uh, it's one of the reasons why I've been pushing expungement and actually the Senate passed a pretty far reaching expungement, started talking about cannabis charges, uh, but looking much more broadly actually, because criminal records we know are disproportionately uh, saddling our black community with records that interrupt housing opportunities, interrupt job opportunities, et cetera. Also to the point about police data, uh, we passed several years ago a mandate that uh, Vermont law enforcement collect racial, racial data at traffic stops. Just as passed a few weeks ago, we actually went further and said any uh, agency that's not abiding by that mandate will see a cut in funding. So we finally put some teeth into it. So I, I'm pleased to have been part of that. There's no question there's more work to do, but there has been some promising steps. Thank you, Chris. Adam, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, really quickly, and, and I agree with the, the sentiments of, of those that have spoken. I, I just want to point to the, the power of, you know, in talking about reparations. I, I think the, the, the core goal, at least as I, I see, and I think most would agree, that the goal of reparations, um, it, it often is thought of too abstractly, um, or it's not defined quite, quite well enough. And I think from a, from a high level, it's restoring 
trust. And I think that that, um, that especially rings true in, in the world of policing, but um, you know, the, the trust of our black and brown communities is, it has been eroding for generations and, and maybe is, is, is this moment that if we can meet it, we can start to repair that trust. Um, and one way that it can be done in addition to the ones that have already been noted about criminal justice, policing, housing, and so on, is how we invest and focus our economic development resources. Um, through Ignite that I, that I run here locally, we do have a, a small investment fund and a small grant fund. And the, the, the power of investing those dollars towards the communities that if historically have been left out of those opportunities um, is great. And you know, if you look at, and I won't go on and on about this, but I encourage you all to look at the impacts of programs like providing microloans for startup businesses that are directed at communities that have historically not been able to get access to capital. And looking at the data and the outcomes of uh, in, in proper full investment opportunities for businesses that are focused on black and brown communities and immigrant communities is a great firm called Unshackled that looks just at this. And the outcomes of those programs are, well, they speak for themselves, I encourage you to look at them. And that speaks to a few things that not, not just doing right in repairing our societal harms, but that also helps build our economy. And in a time where uh, so many of the people who have historically been disadvantaged are just getting continually uh, saddled with, with the, uh, the impacts of COVID, those sorts of outcomes in a, in a range of different ways. So I encourage everyone to look at those sorts of programs. I think the state can do more in investing our, our economic development resources into those communities. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Sydney Hinckley for being our technical support from CEDO and being a great timekeeper. I'd like to thank um, steering committee members, Tony Reddington and Kevin Duderman and uh, Charlie Ginoni who put this meeting together. And I'd like to thank all the candidates for being willing to serve Vermont and our community in the way that they do. So um, the meeting's over. We don't know if we're having an August meeting. Traditionally, we don't, but we might. So that, I'll leave you with that. Um, good night. Keep safe and keep well. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank See you, everybody.